Hey everyone, it's Mark Ferguson with Investor More and back with another real estate video. Today we're talking about some pretty crazy bills that have been introduced in Colorado uh, that are very unfriendly to landlords, real estate developers, and also the people of Colorado. And I'll talk about those, what they are. And these aren't just bills that were introduced and might be shot down. These are bills that are currently, um, most of them have passed the House, are being debated in the Senate, and have a real possibility of passing. And they include rent control, which I have some quotes from our Democratic Governor Polis about that. So this isn't just a um, one-sided affair. There are both sides that disagree, uh, that are against these bills too. And um, rent control is a big one that's being talked about right now. Um, changes to the pet policies that landlords can enact or do, which could be very impactful towards tenants and landlords. Another one for um, no cause evictions, which means you can't evict people if their lease expires unless under certain circumstances you're selling, which wasn't in the bill to begin with. That was even crazier. Um, you're making major renovations um, and, and some other reasons, but we'll talk about that. And finally, the one that nobody is really talking about, which I think is the craziest, the ability of local governments to have first right of refusal to buy multifamily properties from investors when they go to sell them, list them, and um, that includes off-market deals. That one is crazy, and I haven't heard anybody talk about that one, so we'll talk about that one as well. All right, love the likes, love the comments, love the shares, love to hear what you think on these, or if you have more insights into these, I would also love to hear from you as well. Um, I am not a lawyer, I'm not giving legal advice on any of this, I'm just gonna go through some of the bills, read what they say, and then give my opinion on what that might do in Colorado, but none of it is legal advice. And in general, for the most part, when you introduce more legislation, when you have more restrictions, when you make things tougher on developers, landlords, investors, it raises prices. That's usually what happens. That's happened in most places that have rent control. There are actual studies that have shown that. Um, places that have made it tougher on landlords, usually the landlords leave, go other places to invest. That means there's fewer rentals, rents go up, and it can be very, very tricky for the people in that area, not just the investors. And I would say too, for current investors who own properties in Colorado, like I do, or California has many of these laws enacted already, um, Washington, Oregon, New York, sh Chicago, right? Um, current landlords who own properties probably aren't in a horrible position because of these rules and regulations, because they will probably increase prices. They'll increase rents, they'll increase the price of properties, and the people who currently own properties won't be in that tough of a position. Who it will make it tough on are tenants because their rents will probably increase with these um, restrictions. And new landlords, people who wanna become landlords, get into the business, who want to buy in these areas, will make it very tough because prices will be going higher and there will be much more restrictions. And a lot of people say, well, we don't need more landlords. There's too many landlords. There's been a massive decline in the amount of rental properties in the country the last three years. And I talked about that in my last video, but 50% more rental properties have been sold than bought the last three years. And that is why prices have skyrocketed, why the owner occupancy rate has skyrocketed and why rents have been going up so much because there aren't enough rentals. So that's another video, but we'll talk about the bills on this one. So I'm gonna start with the one that's the most popular right now. And I actually think this is the one that's not the most important, even though everybody else seems to think it's the most important one, and that's the rent control bill. Now, there was a study done in San Francisco where San Francisco enacted rent control, and that bill, or that study, sorry, determined rent prices increased 15% over what they would have been without that rent control. And the reasoning behind that, even though people say rent control will make rent cheaper. What happens is rent control laws usually say if a tenant's living in a place and they pay $1,200 a month, next year when their lease is up, it can only go up 5% or 10%, something like that. It can't go up 20% or 30%. It keeps their rent relatively low. So people say, well, that keeps rents low. Well, the thing is you can't restrict every single tenant in every single situation. So if that tenant moves out, then there's no rent control restriction. Then the landlord can raise the rent to whatever they want if that tenant moves out. Or what you see too, is if the rent control bill allows ten landlords to raise the rent 10% every year, they will raise the rent 10% every year because that's all they can raise it. And they know if rents happen to go up higher 
or taxes go up higher or insurance goes up higher for them, they have to be raising it that 10% every year to keep up with costs, which means they might actually raise rents more under rent control than without rent control. Because a lot of times when there's no restrictions, there's no rent control, landlords like myself, I know tons of landlords, they don't raise rent every year. They'll go years without raising rents and they tend to not raise it a ton. They try to keep their good tenants and, and keep things reasonable. But if rent control is in place, it justifies and pretty much writes, you know, gives it in clear and plain writing how much the landlord should be raising their rents and they will. And we see that in real life. So this bill is not enacting rent control in Colorado. It's not saying everyone has to use rent control. All it's doing is repealing a bill that um, prohibited rent control before. So you can't have rent control in Colorado right now. It is illegal to have rent control. This bill would repeal that and allow local jurisdictions, cities, counties, whatever, to have rent control measures. So that's one reason why I don't think it's a end of the world if this passes. I don't, I don't think it should pass. I think it should be voted down. That's my opinion. But if it does pass, it's not enacting it. It's just allowing local areas to enact it. So at least you're just giving more control to the local governments, which in my opinion, it's better to have more local control than more national laws in most cases. Rent control, I think, is not going to help anybody, um, but it's not the end of the world. There's much worse bills, I think, that are out there that aren't getting attention. So Polis himself, I showed you this a second ago, and a lot of people say, oh, you're just bashing Democrats. While almost all these bills were introduced by Democrats, Polis is our Democratic governor, and he has had this to say about rent control. And this is his spokesman said, government Polis is skeptical that rent control will create more housing stock and locations with these policies often have the unintended consequences of higher rent. So even Polis is agreeing rent control usually causes higher rent. He has vetoed multiple bills before that tried to do the same thing because he does not believe in rent control. And so it's not just, you know, Republicans who are saying this, it is a lot of different people who are trying to, um, stop rent control because in the long run, in reality, it usually raises rents. All right, this one is a pet bill, which again, I think will really not impact landlords that much, but really could impact tenants. And you can see here, um, engrossed Senate third reading passed, no amendments. So it is very far along to being accepted, if not already accepted. Again, it's confusing figuring out how all these are passed and um, ratified and all of that. But here's the general um, reading of the rule. It prohibits insurers from denying homeowners insurance based on the breed of dog. So national insurers, maybe that's a good thing, maybe not, but you know, insurance not um, companies can't deny people based on the breed of their dog. So that doesn't really apply to landlords. Um, includes a rough officer executing a writ of restitution, inspect the premises for animals and give any pet to the tenant or to animal control. We've always done that when we have evictions. I think that's basically what you're saying. If you're doing an eviction, look for pets. If there are pets there, give it to the tenant or give it to animal control. That's not a big deal. Um, this is where it gets tricky. Prohibits a landlord from demanding or receiving a security deposit or rent in exchange for allowing a pet or animal to reside on the residential premises with a tenant. So what that means is right now, a lot of landlords will pay or charge an extra pet deposit, right? If the deposit on the house is $1,000 a month, maybe let's say there's a $250 non-refundable pet deposit if you want a dog. And it's an extra $100 a month for that dog if you want to rent this property. This is saying you can't do that. You can no longer charge pet rent or a pet deposit on properties, which basically, if I'm a landlord and you do that and I say, okay, I'm not allowing pets anymore. That makes it really simple and really easy for landlords. And this does not stop landlords from saying that. So what this probably is going to do in real life and reality is make it much, much harder for tenants with pets to find places to live. Um, many more landlords will not allow pets if they can't get extra deposit or money. And I've owned properties that have been damaged by pets from tenants. Cats can destroy a house. They can cause tens of thousands of dollars of damage. Dogs can too. 
Um, everyone says their dog is great and nice. Everyone says their cat is well-trained and behaved. Landlords can't possibly know that. We don't know that for sure. And when animals age, I've had my own animals that, you know, began peeing in the house and causing damage because they just couldn't control themselves. And good tenants can cause damage to houses because of their pets, even if they aren't meaning to, even if that's not their intention, it still can happen. But of course, the Colorado's decided they're going to make up for this by having a fund where under the program, a landlord may receive reimbursement for actual damage caused to a rental premises by a pet animal allowed to reside with a tenant up to $1,000. Reimbursements are granted on a first-come, first-served basis, and the landlord must provide documentation in support of the damages for which the landlord makes a claim of reimbursement. So what they're saying is you can't charge any extra rent or deposit, but if something does happen, we'll give you $1,000 if we have any money. Doesn't quite make up for it. Again, this is probably going to hurt tenants severely because they won't have as many landlords willing to accept pets. Um, all right, and then here's part I just read that I didn't realize was in here. Um, Section 7 prohibits the existing Colorado Affordable Housing Tax Credit from being allocated unless tenants are allowed to keep pet animals at a qualified development where the tenant resides. The required allowance of pet animal is subject to state and local laws governing public health, animal control, and animal anti-cruelty, and is subject to yada, yada, yada. Basically, they're saying if you want to use Colorado affordable housing tax credits, you have to allow pets. That's interesting. And um, I know this can get tricky because I'm very allergic to cats and dogs and animals. And if I lived in an apartment, especially if it had, you know, shared heating, um, any kind of shared ventilation at all, shared hallways, and other tenants have cats and dogs and animals, I'm going to be miserable. I can't live there. So this is interesting, and there might be less landlords accepting Colorado affordable housing tax credits now if this is the case as well. Okay, I went through this one once. I'm redoing it because I learned uh, a lot about this particular bill, and this is um, just cause requirement eviction of a residential tenant. So I thought this was going to be way, way worse in the beginning, they've revised it. It's better, but still not good. And basically what it says, um, I don't know if I want to read through this whole thing, is there are some reasons for a just cause eviction of a tenant, and those are, oh, the tenant doesn't pay rent, the tenant commits a, substan a substantial lease violation, and doesn't cure it. And those are basically the two reasons. Or... If you sell the property and that wasn't in there before before they're saying even if you sold the property there would be a no cause eviction and what does a no cause eviction mean well a no cause eviction means the landlord doesn't have a reason to evict the person and the only reasons to evict them are basically you sell the property they aren't paying rent or they substantially violate the lease you can't evict them just because the lease is up or because you want to raise rent or because you want to do work on the property or even if you want to move in or turn it into a short-term rental. Those are all um, no-fault evictions. And if they're no-fault evictions, that means you've got to pay the tenant two months of rent unless there's someone under 18, over 60, someone has disabilities, or someone has low income. If that's the case, you'd pay them three months of rent. And you have to give them 90 days notice before the lease ends that you're doing this, that you're um, ending the lease early because of one of these reasons. And at the end of that lease, you have to give them either two or three months of rent for relocation assistance. And that includes renovating the property, um, demolition of the property, moving into the property. Uh, it does not include selling the property, which it did before. However, there is another part of this that made it much better. And that is that it only applies to properties where the rent coming in every month is $6,500 or more after you deduct your mortgage, HOA fees, utilities, and other expenses. So it's basically only on properties that make more than $6,500 a month. So that would be on larger multifamily properties that this applies to, um, which helps small landlords, right? It helps them a little bit, but at the same time, that's going to hurt larger multifamily properties which tend to have the lowest rent and that might be where you see the rent going up the most because it makes it more difficult on landlords and when that happens landlords leave they sell they don't develop those properties or they become much more expensive for them to develop them so 
This one could have been way, way worse. It's still not good at all, but because of those two amendments that were changed, um, that has helped it out some. So the no cause eviction one is still um, going to make it very tricky on people who own large multifamily properties, but at least it's not applying to all rental properties, which it did before, and they're still allowing people to sell them without doing uh, a no cause eviction, right? Except the fact that you're selling a large multifamily property you probably don't want to evict any of your tenants. You probably want them there. So those two almost don't really matter. Um, they kind of cancel each other out. So uh, again, not a good bill, but it's better than it could have been. Finally, we're getting to the craziest bill of all, the uh, affordable housing right of first refusal. I talked about this on TikTok. I posted it on my community page on YouTube, on Instagram, Facebook, and this is the one nobody's talking about. I haven't heard anybody talk about it. I randomly found it somewhere and I actually emailed, I'm a realtor, right? So um, there are huge advocates for us and housing and been trying to, you know, stop a lot of these bills and they knew about it, but they weren't really telling people about it. But this one is crazy. So basically this bill creates a right of first refu refusal of local government to match an acceptable offer for the sale of a residential or mixed use multifamily property the right to purchase of the property by the local government is subject to the local government's commitment to using the property as a long-term affordable housing. The local government may assign its right of first refusal to the state, to any political subdivisions, or to any housing authority in the state subject to limitation that the assignee make the same commitment to using the property as long-term affordable housing. The bill requires notices to be given by the seller to local governments and by local governments to the seller and to residents of the property upon reasoning, receiving notice of intent to sell or of a potential sale of the property. A local government has 14 days to preserve its right of first refusal an additional 90 days, I think this was decreased to 60 days, to make an offer. So they've got 14 days to decide if they are interested. Then they have 60 days to make an offer and they must close on the property. This says within 180 days, I think that was shortened to 120 days. All right, so this applies to a multifamily residential or mixed use property consisting of five or more units in urban counties and three or more units in rural or rural resort counties. So if you have a five unit property in urban areas or three unit property in rural areas, you would be required to tell the local government every time you sell a property. Um, and we'll show you all the things that would necessitate you telling the local government you are selling it and give them a right to buy it. It does not include a mobile home park. In exercising its right of first refusal set forth in the subsection, um, a local government may partner with a nonprofit entity, a private entity, or another government entity to co-finance, lease, or manage the qualifying property for the public purpose of maintaining the qualifying property as long-term affordable housing. So it's not just a local government, they can partner with other people as well to do this. Now, if the local government exercises its right of first refusal, it has, you know, 14 days to do that, then the selling party, party, the seller, may not proceed with the sale of the qualifying property to any other property, and the local government shall have a right to make an offer that is economically substantially identical to an acceptable offer on the qualifying property that is identified by the seller. The seller can reject this offer, but the seller can reject the offer made by local government the shell has to provide a written explanation of the rejection and shall invite the local government to make a subsequent offer by identifying the terms and conditions that must be included in a subsequent offer for the residential seller to potentially accept the subsequently made offer by the local government. A residential seller shall not collude with a potential buyer for the primary purpose of inflating a sales price above the market price of a qualifying property. Within 14 calendar days of a triggering event demonstrating a residential seller's intent to sell the qualifying property, a residential seller shall provide notice to the governing body of the local government in which the qualifying property is located. The notice must be given in accordance with sub subsection yada of this section. Here is what a triggering event is. Signs a contract with a real estate broker or brokerage firm to list the property for sale. Signs a letter of intent option to sell or buy or other conditional written agreement with a potential buyer for the sale or transfer of the qualifying property. Um, signs a contract with a potential buyer's real estate broker or brokerage form related to the sale or transfer of the qualifying property. Provides a signed property disclosure form for the qualifying property to a potential buyer. 
lists the qualifying property for sale, makes a conditional acceptance of an offer for the sale or transfer of the liquidity qualifying property, takes any other action to demonstrating an intent to sell the qualifying property. Also, receives a notice of election and demand or list pendants related to the foreclosure of the qualifying property. So if your property is going to foreclosure, you have to notify the government so they can buy it. And also, if a, a sale is going through to a third party, not the government, um, if it terminates, you have to give notice to the government. If the terms of the sale change, you have to give notice to the government. And this is the really fun one here. Prior to the sale of a qualifying property, a residential seller shall execute and record in the real property records of the county in which the qualifying property is located an affidavit certifying under penalty of perjury that they have compl complied with the requirements of this section in notifying the government of all of these things. And here we can see um, the actual wording in the bill has changed even though the summary isn't. The local government has 60 calendar days from providing the notice there might use their right of refusal to make an offer in 120 days to close on the property. And during that time, the seller cannot sell it to anybody else or obviously market it, sign any contracts, do anything. Oh, wow. This is crazy too. I didn't read this. If the sale of the qualifying property is pursuant to an action foreclosure, the public trustee shall provide the notice required under subsection to local government within 14 calendar days after the foreclosure auction. Um, the government has 30 calendar days to submit an offer that is economically substantially similar to the winning offer made at the foreclosure auction. The public trustee is subject to all of the requirements that the residential seller is otherwise subject to under this part. So even if a property goes through foreclosure and sells there, if you buy that property at the foreclosure sale, the government can come along, make a similar offer, and buy it away from you. Now, there are some exceptions to this, very few. If the offer is made to a spouse, partner, a civil union, or a parent, sibling, aunt, uncle, first cousin, or legally recognized, recognized child of the residential seller, so if you sell it to family, you can do that without the government taking it from you. Um, made to a trust if the beneficiaries of the trust are the spouse, partner, um, child, made to, if wholly owned by the residential seller, a partnership, limited liability, company, or corporation. Okay, I'm not sure. Oh, I know what that means. If I own an LLC and I'm selling it to my own LLC, I can do that. That's what that means. Okay. Made pursuant to a will, dissent or intestate distribution. Um made pursuant to an action in eminent domain. If the government is taking it, the other government entity can't take it from that other government entity. That's good to know. Uh, made to a state or local government, made pursuant to a court order, um, made between joint tenants or tenants in common. And this says if someone else has a first right of refusal, maybe the government's right of refusal doesn't exist. So maybe that's one way to get around this, but you have to list, if you can list everybody in the world as having a first right of refusal before the government. Again, not legal advice. <laughs> All right, now what are the penalties if you don't do this? If a court finds the residential seller or a third party buyer that has entered into an agreement with the local government pursuant to a section yada yada is in material violation of this part 12, in addition to any other available remedy, the court shall award a statutory penalty of not less than $50,000 or an amount equal to 30% of the purchase or listing price of the qualifying property, whichever amount is greater. So if you sell a million dollar property, you now get fined $300,000 if you don't do all of this. Okay, so I know that was a lot and I'm so, that was more than I thought it would be, but that gives you just an idea of some of the bills going through Colorado right now and not just ones that are crazy that will be shot down, but those are actively trying to get passed right now in the Senate. They passed the House and they have a good chance of winning and becoming law. Again, they're doing this to try, I, the, the whole reasoning behind the government being able to have the first right of refusal is that they think the government is too slow. They aren't able to buy properties for affordable housing that are on the market. So they want to slow down the process and give the government a chance to do it. So again, if the government's too slow to make an offer on a property, are we really trusting them with affordable housing? I don't know. That's another discussion. But <laughs> like I said, most of these bills, if they go into effect, will make it harder on landlords. If you make it harder on landlords, they will stop being landlords. They will stop buying rental properties in the area. They will stop 
building rental properties in the area. They will leave the area and go somewhere else, which means there will be even less housing in Colorado. A lot of these bills are start out with there not being enough housing in Colorado and they're meant to help that situation. They will actually hurt the situation significantly. And if you're a current landlord in Colorado, I wouldn't be too worried about these because the values of your properties are probably going to skyrocket because you're going to be a, a massive shortage of rentals. If you're trying to become a landlord in Colorado, that's another story. And if you're a tenant in Colorado, I'd be very worried about how much your rent might increase or your options be limited based on these bills. So there is a small example of the government being the government and making our lives so much better. (laughs) So that's all I can possibly talk about for now. Let me know what you think. Love the likes, love the comments, love the shares. Don't worry, I'll have more videos on actually walking through properties and, and doing remodels and different things like that, not just reading bills online.